Hello and welcome to the brand new American Reformation podcast. We long to see the wider American Christian church fall more in love with Jesus by learning from the practices of the early church and other eras of discipleship multiplication. We want to hear from you. Make sure you comment and leave a review wherever you're watching or listening to tell us what God is doing in your life or how you feel about today's conversation. Lord, have your way in us. Let's dive in. Welcome to the American Reformation Podcast. Tim Allman here. I pray wherever you're taking this conversation in today, uh, I pray that the joy of Jesus, his love, his affirmation over you, uh, you are the beloved claimed by him in the waters of baptism. Uh, You do not need to fear the future. You have a God who holds you now and forever in the palm of his hand. He's, He's not letting go. Today, I get the privilege of hanging out with a sister in Christ that I met right when I came to Christ Greenfield over a decade ago. And uh, Danae Pierre, she is a leader uh, of the City to City Global Church Planning Movement, as well as a, an organization called Surge, which our congregation has partnered with uh, over the last decade or so in just lifting our eyes up and out to see the wider kingdom work that the Holy Spirit is accomplishing in the greater Phoenix area. Uh, So thanks so much for hanging out with me today, Danae. How are you doing? Great. It's wonderful to be with you, as always. Yeah, likewise. Privilege is mine. So opening question on this podcast, how are you praying for reformation in the American Christian church today, especially in light of you get to see kind of all different sides of the church. That's what I'm excited about for you. You've rolled in a lot of different streams of the American Christian church. So how how are you praying for reformation? Yeah, you know, I've been joking or not joking, but <laughs> truthfully saying with with um, with uh, people laughing at me that my biggest prayer is that the church would be um, co opted for Jesus. Uh, mm-hmm. That it would just be so clear that the thing that holds us together is a deep, abiding affection and love for Christ, um, and then that would visibly look like us being able to see all parts of the body of Christ as. Uh, brothers and sisters, so that we would see anyone who follows Jesus, any tradition um, as uh, belonging to to the same body that we do. Um, You know, I think also that very much would then look like um, the church visibly um, living in such a distinct way from the culture that we're part of, um, but also in friendship with the culture, so able to affirm the beauty and the good that's all around us. Um, But also just, you know, we have a lot of challenges in the U.S., whether it's um, incredible individualism and consumerism, um, the ways that polarization, nationalism, um, racial divisions, economic challenges are uh, in the culture divisive, but sadly in the church. And that's probably what concerns me the most, that the church would be able to have the ability to um, live into deep union and reconciliation with each other and have eyes to really see and care, um, even if there's dif- different agree- this differences in how to get there, that there would be mm-hmm. a, a shared, passionate, a desire to center the most vulnerable, the least among us um, as core to uh, showing hospitality to Jesus and uh, living into our faith. So that's that, that those tend to be the things oh, that I, yeah. I long for. Yeah. What is it about the human condition? And then as people start to organize the church, uh, what is it about us that wants to find our center uh, in things other than Jesus. I think this yeah. is one of Satan's biggest ploys, right? And you could throw out virtue signaling. I'm this type of a Christian because we do these types of, of things, yeah. or we stand for these respective causes, uh, many of which are biblical. But what I've found a lot of times, Danae, is that we end up organizing around the law and then distinguishing ourselves, law and gospel, I'm a Lutheran, so law and gospel distinction is a big deal for us, right? We we organize ourselves around the law, but there's no freedom in the law. Like it's just a ball and chain, even if it's a good, even if it's a good thing. But then our hearts are trying to distinguish ourselves as better than uh, another brother or sister, someone maybe even outside the faith, created in the image of, of God, uh, rather than just focusing on on Jesus, the affection of Christ for us and for the world. Just talk about that desire to yeah. prove ourselves uh, according to the law, Danae. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think you see Christ again and again in the Gospels, the New Testament come back to um, being controlled by fear or love. And I think mm. that, you know, fear and, and the um, spirit of religion 
uh, asks us to seek out we all we all want a tribe a place to belong um, a community uh, to know that we're not alone in the world and in in the midst of fear especially anxiety we're looking for our people that we're not the only ones that we're not going to be uh, left out and i think that a lot of times that happens is no matter where you are um so people who have the most passionate disagreements can both show up in the spirit of religion looking to a in group to give them their identity and therefore you have an enemy that you point to as um the adversary and you know, we, we see, you know, scripture talk about like our war is not against flesh and blood, it's powers of principalities, but we, the, 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 the structures and systems we set up to protect and to help us, um, maintain a sense of community, safety, equilibrium, um, quickly takes on this power, the powers of principalities that, um, are about protecting us and our people from outsiders, which of course the gospel comes up, up against in every single way. And so we look at what it means to, be controlled by love and there being no fear in love, um, then we are able to be drawn to people radically different than us, even our enemies. And with this um, completely different organizing uh, way of being relationally with one another. And then it's, then we're not, we're not looking to religion, shared traditions, shared theology to give us a shared identity to protect our group. But these become important gifts to the broader community. So we're not like saying, okay, well, let's just be so vanilla that we all kind of just believe very, very broadly, broadly um, in something that kind of encompasses all parts of the body of Christ. Like, no, like we want your distinctions, your your views, your culture, your theology, but but within a spirit of love that has the ability to have deep abiding friendship with each other and love towards the world and move towards our enemies. And so I think those two things... I just think human nature, again and again, no matter what religion you're part of, no matter what type of human history, um, the waves of society, culture, um, evoke such anxiety and fear of what's changing, who's against us, who's going to take away our rights, who's going to trample us. And we just see Christ and again and again call us to a different path, to, to, to the path of crucifixity, to death, um, and that, that his spirit would then allow us to experience this incredible love for the world. Well, that's it, Danae. It's the Holy Spirit. Yes. What's the role yes. of the Holy Spirit? I mean, I, I'm a part of a, of a tradition that is very Christocentric, and that's yes. a very, very good thing, right? Jesus is the center point of all of human history. And yet Jesus, Jesus enters into our broken reality. Uh, this is probably being aired in the season of Christmas, uh, moving into Epiphany. He takes on flesh for us. But when his ministry starts the spirit descends upon him in the form of a dove and he hears the declaration, you are my beloved son. I'm proud of you. Everyone around here, listen, listen to him. If Jesus needed the power of the Holy spirit, how much more so, more so do, do we, uh, you know, Gary Kinneman, Gary's a, a leader here locally. And he talked about the difference between the spirit in us and the spirit upon us. I don't know if you've ever heard that kind of kind of wrestle, um, but I thought I found it theologically very because it wasn't like the Holy Spirit was apart from Jesus. I mean, he was <laughs> conceived in, in the Holy Spirit. Right. But then there was this descending of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus at, at baptism, which, yeah. which mobilized him for this mission of love and care, the fearless call from his father to go and then multiply disciples who would carry on when the spirit fell upon them at Pentecost, uh, crossing over all of these cultural divides just in an audacious way. And then you look at the book of Acts and it is the church crossing all of these former boundaries that you can't, that's not, it's not for them. And it's going all the way back to that call at the very beginning from Genesis chapter 12 uh, for Abraham to be a light to light to the nation. So just talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in our, in our move toward, toward unity and love rather than fear and control. Yeah, well, I'm just going to talk off the top of my head because I'm definitely not a Holy Spirit theologian. <laughs> but, no, no, no. But, but yeah. um, you know, I mean, I've thought a lot recently, you know, especially the last, I mean, yeah, I've thought a lot recently as we've walked through multiple different, at this point, you know, six, seven years of different types of division, conflict, uh, brokenness, mm. um, 
it at all scales. You know, my husband and I minister in downtown Phoenix. It could be a couple that's marriage is falling apart in, in his office. It could be um, a church conflict that has elder teens, uh, you know, in division with someone, you know, in, in, with each other. It could be citywide where there's, you know, so just it doesn't matter the scale. There's these similar patterns that show up. And I just thought so much that the the Holy Spirit in the Trinity um, seems to be this bonding agent between the Father and the Son, and the yeah. way in which um, God's desire for you know, the, the 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 Father and Son's desire for one another, and the Spirit's um, drawing and holding and interconnecting, mm-hmm. and the the three in one concept. Um, mm-hmm seems to be in our own journeys with Christ as well as our journeys with each other, the spirit is drawing us to Christ, to, uh, nice. drawing us to be awakened to our union with him, um, stirring our affections for the father and, and even reorienting how the father's voice actually sounds compared to how we might think it sounds. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think that, you know, the, the Holy spirit in us, there's this, I think there's a lot of mystery around what that means, but practically when you look at the epistles and you look at the, just, if you just were to go through and like write down all the lists that Paul gives us around how to behave towards one another, these aren't like moralistic, like do this, don't do that. Like don't get drunk, do, you know, tie. But it's not, I mean, when you read it just like plainly, you could, you could interpret it that way. But I actually think these are like relational ethics to Mm -hmm. allow us to walk in step with the spirit. And when we don't do them, when we're not patient, when we're not kind, when we don't believe the best, when we don't forgive, um, when we slander, when we do all these things, we are grieving the Holy spirit and Mm -hmm. in us and in the union that we have with one another. And so I think a lot of times that, um, our lack of spiritual maturity and depth, um, tends to treat the Holy Spirit just like a, um, an experience that we would, uh, you know, get to, get to enjoy when really the purpose of it is to, um, move us towards one another, uh, and the, uh, the, and the Christ in the other. And so I don't, I don't know if that's exactly what you're talking about, but I just, yeah, think, no, I'm good. um, yeah, I just think that there's this, this deep need for us to be in such communion with Christ that the very way in which we behave towards one another, not for moralistic reasons, but for um, the full breadth of what it means to receive the blessings of Christ that he's poured us. So, so the, the practice of being patient at the fruit of the spirit, um, it, like having the, the spiritual muscle of patience developed is challenging, but, but experiencing the fruit of it in a relationship that you've been engaged in that's been really difficult for six or 10 years it's, it's heavenly. Like when you get to taste that, and I just don't know that we've really thought through the Holy spirit as being the trainer, uh, of our, of our souls and our relational practices. Um, which means it just kind of stays surface. We have this great experience, you know, me and Jesus, my music, my cup of coffee. Um, but it's not like deeply forming us in ways that are leading to this abundant fruit that tastes and smells like heaven. Oh yes, man. You drop patience connected with the Holy Spirit, Danae. I don't, I think that the Holy Spirit is the comforter and patience, the root of patience is uh, Latin to suffer with. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit is the only one. And, and it is this expectation for the future. There's, there's a coming day of, of hope. That's what in our right. tradition, what Advent is all about, right? The recognition Christ came and Christ is going to, to come again. And now you have the comforter who helps you be patiently waiting as well as patient with each other through the crosses, through the suffering, through the trials of, of life. That is just the way it is. But man, aren't humans so prone to, I want to reject suffering trial. Give it to me. Give it to me now. You've entered into a number of different conflicted spaces. And I'll let you just kind of share a little bit of your your story, um, respecting obviously confidentialities for those who listen to this. But God's given you that ability to connect people. And um, one of the, I'll throw it out, one of the um, areas where I think you, you walk through struggle was th- this justice uh, conversation 
what does biblical justice look like? And the social justice gets thrown out. And it was just so conflated, so polarizing um, today. So how would you, as we enter into maybe a, an area of, of conversation where we're going to need to rely on the, the Holy Spirit here, Danae, yeah. how yeah. would you help us understand social justice and biblical justice today? And even tell a little bit of your work then with Surge, if, if, you, if yeah. you could. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I so I was born and raised in West Phoenix. Uh, my family immigrated from Honduras on my mom's side of the family. So uh, she was born there. And by the time I was born, all my all her family was here in the wet and most of her family was here. And so um, what's interesting about the way that the whole conversation has been framed politically and at a national scale of conversations um, is that it's such an it's such a like idea um, it's a, it's framed in a way that you can you can pick a side and debate at a dining room table, dining room table. But I think that what's so beautiful about what Christ does in the Gospels is he's walking around and bumping in, you know, bumping in or pursuing or inviting the least and the overlooked um, into communion at his at a dining room table, uh, reclining with you know wealthy people, people who are. Um, in positions of influence or power or kind of the, you know, the, the tax collecting middle, middle, middle man. Um, <laughs> and, and there's just this relational approach that never lets you put someone in a box. Um, and so as I was, you know, kind of coming up through the church and engaging in, um, at the time, initially, it was really working with birth parents who were in the foster care system. So we're a multi-ethnic church in downtown Phoenix um, we are seeing families in our in a neighborhood just down south from us that we spend a lot of time in be impacted by the foster care system, and all kind because we were so proximate and embedded in these families' lives, the challenges and the justice issues were so complex. And it wasn't like you could just point to one person. You could have a, a caseworker who um, really dropped the ball, but if you really sat with the caseworker, it, it was a hundred systemic reasons mm. way beyond her control or the judge's control. It's just it, the complexity was so overwhelming that I think it allowed us to um, see from all these different angles and engage to advocate to make things better. I think, you know, similar with immigration uh, challenges and church members who aren't documented and how do we kind of walk through this individually, love them and care them, but then like if there's a court hearing or if there's kind of a law that, needs that that's going to be um, decided on that massively impact impacts um, someone who's not documented or people who've been impacted by incarceration. So kind of just like ministering in a particular context, if you're working with, um, it doesn't put you into one issue, but all the issues, right? Because they're mm-hmm. all interconnected. Right. Mm-hmm. And so what we began to see, what, what I began to notice as um, 2016 was really probably two or three years into growing division around how do Christians engage. And we were bringing together as surge pastors from very different contexts, suburbs, urban, inner city, majority, you know, white evangelical churches, um, which would kind of be what a lot of the traditional um denominations that are that had been connected to surge would would be if you walked into their church would be 90 percent either because of where they live or their tradition right um and their theological tradition i mean um or and then we would have churches that were historic african-american um hispanic spanish-speaking churches so we were beginning to bring this mashup of people together and um and i don't know that people fully appreciated i think we knew it was rare and unique but in the scope of the nation um, we were seeing something a lot more mature and, and more relationally deep than other places. And so um, as politically things began to heat up on the national stage and pastors began to get challenges in their own congregations, people with different opinions, different I- ideas, um, and language began to be described. Oh, that's that's woke or that's uh, social justice or that's you know, and and there's arguments, no, this is what biblical justice is. And there's all these papers being written and journal articles. And I would just say like, if you're in proximate relationship and walking with friends who are impacted um, by poverty and mental health and, you know, generational uh, poverty and housing policies that are hundreds of years old that are still impacting rents today, like if that's a mom sitting next to you at church with her three kids, um, it isn't so simple to say which box do you fit into. Now, what, now the temptation in me though was as things 
key to that was to look out to the broader landscape and hear the language of the people group I was drawn to and to identify with them because I shared so much of their language, their ideas and policies, how to make changes. No, I mean, never a hundred percent for anyone, but in the, in the midst of fighting and seeing sides form, I'm like, Oh, I'm far more this group versus that group. Or if I have to pick, I'm going to pick that. And I think, I think we have to, as, as leaders train ourselves and our church members to recognize that internal pull to identify with a people group as opposed to the body of Christ, because the body of Christ is going to require I identify with people whose, whose ideas of how to impact my, my, some of my family members who might not be um, documented may actually be an act of harm. Like it might actually be their decisions, their language, their Facebook posts, their, their advocacy politically may actually hurt someone in my family. Um, We've seen it, we've experienced it. And yet my internal pull, that, that tribe that I want to help me feel less afraid and more safe, is going to look to a broader group that shares my political identity or my, um, my language or my ideology or my philosophy. And there has to be a spiritual practice to say, no, I'm going to root deeper in Christ and deeper in union with my brothers and sisters and practice the relational practices to be one, not just to dialogue, but we do need to love our neighbors. We do need to address the issues on the, on the Jericho road and make sure someone's taking care of these hospital bills for that person that got wounded. Like, like there's actual like present care for, for those who are hurting and systemic care that has to happen, but never at, but never, it has to happen through my lived practice of embodied forgiveness, union with union with my brothers and sisters, speaking truth and love, believing the best, hearing their stories, sharing my story, not fighting, but also um, saying, hey, I like, like, let's, let's engage in this together. And so I would say how that's been held with also saying, and it doesn't mean I'm going to stop and wait. Like, like if someone's hurting and there's issues that need to be addressed as a Christian, I want to advocate if I'm going to be dismissed because that fits into your box of whatever you think is evil politically, um, then I'm going to show up and when I'm around you, try to try to engage and love you. I, I can't stop what I'm doing, which I do think is a, another mistake we can make where we, we, we think our whole job is just to get, have everyone get along. It's like, well, that doesn't make our neighbors flourish. Just us spending all of our time in a church trying to get all these people to get along doesn't act, doesn't necessarily, it can, but it doesn't necessarily produce a better, a city that's flourishing. So whatever that tension, which is why you need the Holy Spirit, right? Like whatever that tension yeah. is between those things of walking in love, who are primary, identi- who are primarily identified with, and how we then behave towards each other, outsiders and enemies, I think is is key and massive. Ah, oh, Danae, so much there. Thanks for articulating the the tension of living out the truth and love in in a beautiful way. And um, I'm drawn to the book of Galatians a lot recently. And it's Paul's kind of, you, you think of Romans, Danae is kind of his magnum opus kind of theological treatise, but then Galatians is this raw and gritty <laughs> book about uh, Jews wanting their social custom circumcision in this case to kind of be something that's put upon the Gentiles. And, and the apostle Paul opposes, it says, I oppose Peter and then James, brother of Jesus, to their faces. Because they were putting on these heavy burdens of of the law, uh, Paul's call was always for for the nations that Jew and Gentile. His mission now was was to the Gentile, and yet at the very end, so you got the fruit of the spirit that gets talked about in Galatians five. At the very end, he says something that's just magnificent, and in so much as it relies upon you, live at peace with everyone. Yeah. especially those within the body of, of Christ. Sure. And, yeah. and he's, he said all of these very hard words. And then he goes, and remember that I have on my body the marks of Christ. He's kind of, there's this very human reality. I, I'm suffering for this. I'm, I'm walking that, that middle way, you could say, or carrying the cross of Jesus Christ. And so some of you actually may be very upset with what I said. You may come from a Jewish Jewish background and you may even want, want to take my, my life. He's kind of saying, don't don't do that. I care for you. I love you. I want to walk in in unity with you. And I pray based on uh, how you've seen me live my life that you can receive these these harder words. Any 
any clarity around the Apostle Paul and his his journey and how that kind of helps us helps us walk biblically faithful and yet never compromise. And then I'm drawn to First Corinthians 13, which is a live verse. I mean, if you right. understand all of these mysteries and you don't have love, you're a clanging gong. Uh, I think yeah. that's the tension you're trying to articulate. Is yeah. that right, Danae? Yeah, I mean, I think I think live at peace with everyone. I think, um, you know, I'll just speak to pastors and leaders directly who I've been working because this is what I've been working with for a while. Is um, I do think the pastorate draws people who um, have stories of brokenness, where making peace um, as a diplomat or a middleman or a um, let's negotiate and like lowest common, let's just like, let's just get along, you know? So like whatever the anxiety is in the system, let's just, like, let's just get along. Even if it means, um, overlooking the, the most vulnerable in our midst or those who are bleeding and wounded and, and hurting and need us to take action, which I don't think is what Paul is saying. Um, I think, I, I think there is a radical call to live at peace by, um, yeah, walking, you know, that first Corinthians 13 passage, um, moving to, you know, look at the Sermon on the Mount, um, even the ways in which we engage our enemies. And so I think, I think, I think there, there's a real important moment that we've, that I think God has kindly brought the church through the last eight years. And we're going to probably have eight to 30 more years of it, of mm. intense, intense conflict where you can't, as a pastor, keep the peace in a congregation or keep the peace just by dialoguing and talking about it and looking at it from every angle. It's like, no, we actually have to move away from talking and walk, like follow in Christ's steps. And where did Christ go? And that's how we're going to keep, that's how we will be, be good news people and um, invite people to to banquets, you know, of, of, of feasting around peace, Right. Um, and I, and I kind of just think that that is the, the call to be able to, um, live at peace in ways that, that gets really silent about justifying ourselves and the actions that we take, um, always submitting to a, a community, a community of people to, um, look at, to ask questions, to walk with us. Um, but not needing to just kind of continue to dialogue and debate and argue and advocate for our, our position, but really to say, hey, let's invite you to join us in this walk with Christ and this journey of, of peacemaking um, as we go to the people you most, you seem to most despise based on your rhetoric, your language. And and, from, and, that, and that's in all directions. You know, some people that's in more politically, you know, in our American context, maybe politically conservative spaces. Like, what does it mean to embed yourself with um, progressives that you disagree with and really go love your neighbors a little bit better together yeah. and some of the, you know, it, um, justice spaces, advocacy spaces, um, that have a lot of hurt towards religion or whatever. Like, what does it mean to engage and practice nonviolent communication and enemy love and like walk with, um, aunt, you know, aunt Betty who, um, is watching TV shows that you can't stand and using language you don't like, like, what does it mean to actually like know her heart and love her and walk mm. with her? So that when I think of like live at peace, it is not a neutral position, but a very yeah, active sure. faith that I, I think we have very little, um, we, we have a lot of work to do to develop those kind of skills. Well, it's all about relationship and time and trust across yeah. whatever the spectrum spectrum mm-hmm. may be, uh, yeah. politically, spiritually, mm-hmm. et cetera. And yeah. pastors, what and, I'm praying for, yeah, go ahead, Danae. Fill, well, fill that in. And, and intentionality. The, the, our, yeah, sure. We will naturally drift towards people who agree with us. Uh, and right. naturally resist uh, those who don't, you know. And pastors, just to land that plane, uh, I'm praying for pastors who are uh, confident in who Jesus has made them, and then remarkably humble to engage to engage struggles um, that that are around them within their congregation. You know, if, if a pastor. Uh, is overly is overly passive. They're probably going to be just more internally focused and just caring for for the sheep. But that's not the way the Good Shepherd Jesus led. He always moved us up and out into into spaces that were uncomfortable. He continues to do that today. So I'm praying for pastors who are better handling conflict and the conflict starting within. 
not wanting to upset the apple cart and then to cross into um, spaces and people groups that are that are where Jesus would go. The least, the lost, the lonely, the hurting, the marginalized um, and those who even share different different worldviews, different ideologies, different political persuasions that we would listen twice as much as we speak. I'm so grateful for you. So help us. Shifting to another topic here, um, Danae, uh, you're, are you called in your, in your tribe, are you called, you're ordained as a pastor, right? No, I'm not. You're not. You're not. Okay. No, well, no, I want to yeah. speak to women's leadership. I didn't, yes, I didn't know if you were it. or not, but yeah. uh, yeah. our tribe doesn't, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, uh, have women pastors per se. Mm-hmm. We have women in various leadership roles. Um, and, and we base that largely on the order of creation <laughs> argument. Adam first, and then Jesus took flesh as a man. And th- I'm not trying to debate at all, though some in our tribe would love to <laughs> debate, but help us understand from scripture how some denominations make the case, not just for women's ordination, but for women in leadership roles in general. Yes, that's a big question. So um, it is. Well, I'll, well, I'll say, you know, just as, as a case study, so I'll kind of, I'll do this really quickly. Um, yeah, my husband is part of a tradition and network and his theological belief uh, would be all all people in leadership, men and women. But yeah, when it comes to eldering ordination, that's male. Elder probably okay. similar to I would assume similar, yeah, complementarian um, mm-hmm. frameworks. Yep. That is what yep. the, where we would use that your tradition would have. Um, I was an Assemblies of God uh, minister heading towards ordination when we met and um, have and we married, and so I have existed in a complementarian church with a broader, much broader interpretation of what I think women um, biblically can do. And then I've been serving within a network that has a crossover, but Phoenix in general is, we have very, we have a, a lot more of my East Coast churches that I work with would have a, t- a lot of women ministers and egalitarians would be the other word that's used, but um, not, Phoenix just has very little of that. And so just to kind of go back to the earlier conversation, this is an issue that there has been such passionate division on where mm. um, complementarian churches say it's a gospel issue, which is kind of a divisive way to position egalitarians. And egalitarians will say it's a justice issue, which can kind of be demeaning and not really authentic, not really like nuanced enough for complementarians. So, so I've, I've just kind of always gone back to what does it mean to live in union and to allow mm. each other to um, wrestle with these important decisions and then, and then flesh them out in ways that um, reflect the body of Christ and uh, respecting that different traditions, different hermeneutics um, are going to land you in different places. And if we're all trying to be faithful to scripture, and this is an area that the church has been historically um, divided on uh, or different, I'll say different, then could it possibly be that how we hold that tension together could be a beautiful witness to Christ. And so the networks I lead locally and nationally have complementary and egalitarian pastors We've got pastors who don't ordain women in their churches supporting female church planters and other denominations. There's a lot of these things happening in Phoenix that are very unique that I'm very proud of. Um, so would be, that's just backdrop. Cool. Um, I love it. I think, uh, I don't, I'll, secondly, I would say um, the way that I can't necessarily, I think you're asking me to, to give, to explain biblically why people think, oh, oh. So I think you're saying like, restate the question in terms of like theolog- <laughs> I love it. The- the- I love theologically, it. No. are you yeah. asking me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. for women, because we have we have women in a variety of different leadership roles and we have deaconesses, we have uh, educators um, in, in our tribe, but we've kind of drawn the line at, at ordination um, yeah. as being yeah. the, the male right. role, right. right? So help us understand those that may say, well... You, you, there could be a little bit more of an open understanding of, of ordination. Yeah, yeah. And for those, let me let me give this caveat for those of you who yeah. are very conservative LCMS Lutherans. Yeah. I am not personally making this argument. I'm just asking this question so that we can yeah. understand more more deeply. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll use my. Uh, let me just. I can't necessarily unpack that well, partly because um, I just told you about my marriage, and we spent mm-hmm. I think the first eight years reading. I think he read every possible book imaginable. He's a high, he's very intellectually wired. I'm like, how do we just figure this out and love each other? And, <laughs> you know, and I read plenty, but that's not my, my strength would not be ever arguing for specific okay. positions, but I'll say two things. One is there's two conversations that get meshed together that I think is really, really important for, and I'll just speak to women directly who um, have a burden and calling and longing to, 
to minister, to teach, to preach, to vocationally engage in these things. Um, one is theological. How do you understand scripture? And where does that, in the existing structures we have, what does it mean, right? And that we just have to honor and respect the different hermeneutics and how people hold their Bibles together and interpret it. That if people are taking the Bible seriously, um, so I could spend two hours with you and give you my position on why I think women can preach and it's and it's great to have. We shouldn't have all male anything. I could I could give a lot of. Well, I could spend five <laughs> hours talking about that. Uh, maybe five days, Love it. but Love it. but but at the end of the day, um, it's I have if we're all taking scripture seriously and we know that about each other, um, we have to respect that. It. It's not just like, Oh, you're, you don't care about the Bible or you're a sexist. Like, no, like this is how we understand within our hermeneutics, what it means to live this out A church, having mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters faithfully. And it's so complex based on your ecclesiology, how you structure what, what roles different have. It's just very complicated. So I think that's one that um, we have to, live in the tension of all the time. Mm -hmm. The other one that I think is far more important is the way in which um, the existing systems and structure and the American church is just massively um, harmful to women in its mm -hmm. lack of, um, in its lack of, in, in its blind spots to what we've described as Christian leadership or pastoring and it's really just a, a hyper male American kind of like picture that not even all male leaders fit into that I just think is harmful for the whole body. So there is, mm -hmm. you know, I've been the only woman in all male pastor settings for two decades. And each time over time, lots of women end up, end up there, but usually the first three to five years, it's just me. And it's, it's, ma it's been massively toxic and harmful and, um, mm. and just, the, and just, I don't even think godly at times because all male settings don't have the ability to even see what's cultural, what's what's just kind of like our like our locker room culture that we've now Christianized and we call it it's this bro club of pastors. And we love it because we get to hang out with our bros, but like there's no women here actually helping us engage with mission. So that would be that's the bigger thing where I think um my my hope is always to untangle the conversations and say, okay, your theology does not actually determine how you treat me as a sister in Christ and what it means to relate to me as a as a woman who has gifts to offer and to work with. And so, um, I so many of the women I work with, I just kind of say the for me personally, I'm like I I don't I spent a lot of my uh, early years fighting, advocating, pushing, trying to help people see what they're not seeing, blind spots. And I do think that was, I do think that, that God has used that. I also just don't want to fight anymore. So I'm like, you know, like how, what is it? There's actually something very kingdom and beautiful about serving where we can serve. And those who are in positions of power have, or leadership, you know, like eldering, have to be radically curious and uncomfortable all the time with how their structures may cause how their structures and their own cultural blind spots may cause them to overlook high quality women um, who would never make it to the table. I am only in the, I'm doing all these roles in different places because there's about there's two different brothers, um, Christian brothers who have intentionally opened doors for me over the last two decades. And that's out of hundreds. And, and over time, I think, in the leadership spaces, we've seen differences, but, but the, if those two brothers had not like come down to where I was and not seen me as a secretary or treated me like one and allowed me to really have substantial leadership um, way before I was even ready. And then helped me through all the different translation and cultural challenges. I never would have been able to be in these roles and I wouldn't, I didn't have the muscles to even like hold it well because it was so hard. Um, and so I think, I think pastors really have, if you're in an all male setting, you've got to be very intentional to go look for uh, sisters in Christ and bring them in and all the barriers, you know, all the fear, all the risks, all the rules that keep us out of the room. We've got to be very intentional about um, working around them and creating new pathways. Yes. Um, thank you for being you and for your courage and staying in the conversation and using your gifts um, beautifully. We have, 
uh, many female leaders within our church body who share your your sentiments. And I'm praying for those that listen and have areas of influence that you would men be one of the two of the hundred, I just heard you say, within the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod who would recognize the gifts of the entire body of Christ, women and men, and invite them into the room. Um, right now, some of our struggles within, within our tribe, Danae, I think can partially be attributed to the, uh, the bros club that you were talking about and and the power dynamics that are there when it's all men in a room rather than and what I've heard in this conversation what I've known to be true and over the years as I've listened and read read you the sensitivity of inviting many different people with many different gifts uh, to be present and that is that is the female voice generally right that that has that sensitivity that that necessity to create safety and we need one another right the male voice and I'm speaking very generally here is is more you know let's go take it get it done drive do it you know and and it's amazing just rounding back to Jesus how he speaks and lives with both of those voices consistently doesn't he yeah. he models yeah. and 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 how countercultural it was for Jesus to have invited many, many women to, yeah. to the table. Um, right. And then the first evangelist uh, or apostle to the apostles is, is uh, Mary. Uh, she goes back and, and Martha too, going back. We've seen, we've seen the Lord, right? We've seen the Lord and these guys, they don't, yeah, just go off on well, that. <laughs> well, his, I mean, his, besides John, the beloved, the most, his most intimate relationships are women at the foot of the cross, yeah. his mother, right. Mary, yeah. you know, you know, women who are ministering to him, washing his feet with tears. And I just, in, in a system and a structure, um, no matter how you interpret it, whether he chose only 12 men or could only have male disciples, he, he has intentionally included female disciples in, in the broader community and given them roles, been in relationship. Um, interdependent with them. And so I think that th what what's happened with there being such a lack of female presence leadership is that those who can get to the table um, might have to push and fight. And, and there's something that in me wasn't developing in my spiritual leadership, in my spiritual development, in my leadership, um, because I was doing that work. Now, other things developed that, that were really great and resiliencies and skills I wouldn't have developed had it had been easy for me. Um, but when you have to be a prophet, you don't get to be a creator. When you have to advocate mm -hmm. for all women, you don't get to build and innovate and design uh, the way that you that you might if you didn't have to, to kind of be the agitator. And so there's been, I think, a growing desire for me to see more depth in women being able to have um, a sense of confidence of who Christ has called us to be so that when we show up in these spaces and we feel the need to be prophetic or the, all of that, that, that we, there's just a real deep wisdom and discernment to know what to say when, um, and to just live into our callings to create and cultivate community, no matter what it's called, what it's named, what it's resisted that we, and when we feel the internal hurt, the tiredness, the, um, the erosive, you know, feeling of, of being the challenger or that, whatever those are, that instead of it just being about the system, which is might be very well true, we let that be an invitation for us to have deeper knowing of God and ourself and yeah. what and, and who we are and who he is. Similarly, I would mirror that to the brothers is when we say, well, we have, you know, often they'll say to me, we don't have women ready to step into that role. Or I would hire a woman, but, but she, or that woman's a great leader, but she's really struggles here, here, and here. Well, when you've been, um, in that like when the environment is what it is there, you don't necessarily have the same full you know you're yeah you're gonna have to be very intentional to meet people where they're at and let them experience that that healing and that growth and let their their presence bring healing and growth to your own system and structure and that's one thing I've, i really respect about how my husband ramon has led roosevelt as in the last 16 17 years each female leader or even just a person from a different culture who's who's come in to our existing space you know i'll i'll look a year later and see how the entire team meeting the there's just all these little things that begin to adapt and change based on that new person's presence and wanting them to be able to contribute 
And I think that that has to be, you know, we can't just plop in a different culture or a different gender, a different age person into an existing community and say, okay, the community has to stay the same. You have to adapt. So we go, okay, well, there's a reciprocity that has to happen. That's part of our all growing up into the fullness, the full maturity of Christ. Yes. Thank you for just sharing vulnerably uh, the the wrestle right now. And thanks for staying engaged as a gifted leader um, with lots to offer, uh, to shape, to challenge appropriately, um, and yet to do so with a spirit of, of love. Uh, final, final, I could ask you so many other things. What, let me, let me allow you to brag on Surge a little bit and, um, and what Jesus is doing with Surge as we close. Yeah. Um, well, man, so Surge has been organized as this, as this, um, really it's a, movement of brothers and sisters in Christ, different churches, different denominations, who really are giving a lot of their time and energy to being the leadership of, of, a, of a vision of a city movement. We want every church member and everyone who identifies as a Christian in Arizona to see their life as making Jesus visible um, individually and collectively. And so um, the thing I'm most excited about is there's probably you know, 20, 30 leaders, probably maybe 50 who are giving week, weekly, monthly time leadership um, to the, the vision and mission. Um, and a lot, in a lot of places that not as like, quote unquote, surge the nonprofit, um, but as Jesus followers. And so I just, I'm really encouraged by um, what's happening in Arizona, way beyond surge. There's different partners and all kinds of different city movement uh, spaces, evangelism and campus ministry and public schools, um, foster care. Yeah, right, but I'm right. just like, man, there, and there's such a sweet friendship and respect happening. So I would say just more than surge, what's happening in Arizona, this, this burden for unity and Christian witness um, is really encouraging. And then with surge specifically, the ability to really help churches make disciples and think through what it means to be a holistic disciple I'm um, in every part of their life, you know, that we're 16 years in. And so we've got several thousand church members now who've been through our different training programs who are, and, and to see visibly businesses, nonprofits, um, buildings, uh, houses, like visibly see government positions. Uh, this guy was telling me Sunday, he's got a job um, advocating for water policy and how eight years ago, surge really shaped that his whole trajectory and just to think that we have we have people actively thinking through the future of water in Arizona through this, you know, gospel lens Kingdom. of, mm-hmm. yeah, and, and like, it's just, it's really powerful. And so I'm very thankful. And um, yeah, I would just always love more prayer for us to be discerning what the Spirit's saying, um, quick to uh, repent and uh, align with God's uh, vision for us in our lives and that we walk in the Spirit. Uh, this has been so much fun. Danae, uh, thank you for your generosity of, of time, your spirit, the gift that you are, the friend that you are to me. I, I have to say this just uh, to give just high respect to you. When I entered into the Valley as, as a pastor, I came from Denver. I came from kind of a city movement environment. And when I, when I met you, I was like, oh, here, she, <laughs> she gets me and she gets what the Holy Spirit is up to in, in the city. And I don't, I don't just want to be a suburban pastor. I want to be a part of uh, seeing what God is doing, celebrate what God is doing across the entire city of Phoenix. Uh, we, we, when I met you, we wouldn't have probably started La Mesa apart from like recognizing, hey, there's a huge need for the lower income, the hurting and the marginalized, those who not are identified as kids in the kingdom of God, not as just homeless individuals, but those that are experiencing homelessness and addiction and poverty and despair. And we're really close right now, Danae, to opening up the, the first uh, tiny house community in the state of Arizona, uh, in partnership with a whole bunch of different, different networks. And so, uh, surge, you may not know it, but the, the ripple in impact of surge when I entered in here is having a, a radical kingdom, kingdom impact. So praise be to Jesus. Uh, if people want to connect with you, Danae, how can they do so? And uh, surge. Web- website, uh, surge network.com. And, um, I think there's an email address for me somewhere on there, but, uh, not, uh, yeah, 
it's I, my name is unique so it's easy to find me <laughs> Social media stuff. Yeah. D E N N A E for sure. So, this is the American yeah. Reformation podcast. Sharing is caring. Please like, subscribe, comment wherever it is you take in podcasts like this. Uh, greatly appreciate it. And we promise to continue to have compelling conversations that, that stretch us, that open us up to what the Holy Spirit is doing all around us. It's a good day. Go and make it a great day. Thanks so much, Danae. Appreciate it. Thank you.